DPM Heng Swee Keat. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank members of this House for the thoughtful debate over the past two days. And in particular, I'd like to thank the 57 MPs, including all nine NMPs, who, of, who rose to offer your perspectives and suggestions. I don't have 57 files, just two. <laughs> now, I also learned many new terms, including Mr. Lim Sui says, H2P2, happy and healthy, productive and purposeful. Professor Lim San San's three Ms, not massively more money, but mobility, maturity, men mentality. And Mr. Ang Hin Kee's, Unun Tia Bihun, steadily we eat the Bihun. Now, special thanks to Mr. Liang Ying Hua, for the, who opened the debate as chairman of the GPC for finance and trade industry. Now, beyond this house, I also appreciate the many helpful, constructive perspectives shared by fellow Singaporeans. They have enriched a national conversation on this budget, and the issue is six to address. This year's budget takes place under exceptional circumstances. It is a trying moment for businesses, workers and households having to deal with both the softening of the global economy and the sudden COVID-19 outbreak. How we respond to moments of challenge and crisis is a test of our individual resilience and the strength of our character. Even more, it is a test of our social cohesion and solidarity. It is a test of who we are as a people, as a nation. Do we panic and become self-centered, or do we stay calm, band together, and look after one another? Since I delivered the budget statement last week, some have asked, why call it our unity budget? My answer is simple. It expresses our confidence that Singaporeans will rally together to meet our challenges head on. It expresses our conviction that we will emerge from this test stronger, more resilient, and more united than ever before. It expresses the spirit shown by many Singaporeans of staying united as one people through thick and thin. Beyond fighting the COVID-19 outbreak, our unity will be the foundation for Singaporeans to press forward and write the next chapter of the Singapore story. United, we can overcome the longer-term challenges of ageing, technological disruption, social inequality and climate change. United, we will make sure that the Singapore story endures and goes from strength to strength. We should not take our unity for granted around the world and closer to home. We have seen societies torn by forces that foment polarisation, communal conflicts and political turmoil. This has weakened their social cohesion and the sense of togetherness that is so essential for societies to meet the complex challenges of the day. We need, as many thoughtful commentators pointed out, a whole of society response. I'll round up this budget by addressing members' contributions along four key themes. First, how we will overcome the immediate challenges and the COVID-19 outbreak together. Second, how we should manage our finances collectively to provide for our future. Third, how we should tackle the long-term challenge of climate change and turn our constraints into strengths. Finally, how we can create opportunities for all and build better lives for Singaporeans in changing times. First, let me speak on our present challenges. Having gone through SARS 17 years ago and other outbreaks such as the H1N1 since then, we are much better prepared for COVID-19 today. With systematic and long-term planning, we have developed new facilities like the National Centre for Infectious Disease, Diseases, deepened research capability in health and biomedical sciences, honed, built up our networks of experts and honed our effectiveness in contact tracing and quarantine. Most importantly, we have well-trained and dedicated people. These capabilities are now deployed to good effect to deal with the COVID-19 outbreak. Although we have kept the outbreak contained so far, 
it has already had a significant effect. In these challenging times, we have acted decisively to protect families and workers through the care and support package and the stabilization and support package. I have received a wide range of feedback about the support. Many are relieved that we have a strong and decisive budget with both broad-based measures and targeted support. Many members of this House have asked if we are doing enough, particularly for businesses in the sectors directly affected and those feeling the knock-on effects. On the other hand, some economists have wondered if we are doing too much. Now, we must not fight the current war simply based on the lessons of the last war. Every crisis and downturn is different. So we should, to the best of our ability, make a sound diagnosis of the current challenges and apply a decisive course of action, or as one says in Chinese, Dui Chen Xia Yao, fit the remedy to the case. At the same time, we must, remember, we must bear in mind the caution that Ministers Gan Kim Yong and Lawrence Wong have given. This is a fast-moving, fluid situation. While the evidence is that the impact of the COVID-19 virus is more like H1N1 than SARS, its rapid spread through places like Iran, Italy and South Korea demonstrates the fluidity of the situation. We must maintain a state of dynamic vigilance and be prepared to adjust course as new information comes in. Let me address whether we are doing enough and in a timely manner. The overall size of our spending in Budget 2020 is appropriate for now. We have calibrated it to put sufficient purchasing power back into the economy while injecting a boost of confidence. In fact, our budget is higher than what most economists had expected. This took into account the context of the global slowdown and the wider uncertainties. We are applying support to where it matters most. Our first priority is jobs. The two biggest items in the stabilization and support package, the jobs support scheme and the wage credit scheme, are focused on preserving and enhancing jobs. With greater job assurance, workers are in a better frame of mind to go for training. It will also avoid them having to cut down too much on consumption. SMEs, which employ the bulk of local workers, and whose concerns were raised by Mr. Nispoa and Mr. Ong Teng Kun are a key focus of these two schemes. As a percentage of revenues, SMEs will receive payouts that are on average five times as much as the average for all enterprises. This is on top of the help they will also receive through the corporate income tax rebate and other measures. Second, we are giving support to those sectors which are most directly impacted by COVID-19. Our sector-specific measures are calibrated according to the extent to which each sector has been affected. Tourism, accommodation and aviation have been hit hardest and are therefore given additional support. In total, these sectors will receive over $400 million in addition to the broad-based support that they will get through a job support scheme, wage credit scheme and corporate income tax rebate. This will include enhanced absentee payroll support for workers, an issue that Mr. Xia Kenping raised. Ministries will announce further details on this. Third, we have extended support to other groups who have felt the ripple effects, including self-employed persons. We have provided additional measures to support taxi and private hire car drivers, hawkers, tourist guides and operators of F&B and retail outlets. This additional support totals over $200 million and is over and above the support from broad-based measures which form the bulk of the support for them. Mr. Desmond Chu, Ms. Ting Pei Ling and Ms. De Gan Tiam po asked if we could do more to take care of other groups of SCPs and freelancers who are more affected by the outbreak. Mr. Pritam Singh raised the issue of uh, drivers, uh, of buses. The relevant ministries will announce details for these other groups subsequently. Fourth, 
we have designed our measures to be able to reach enterprises as quickly as possible. Mr. Saktiandi Supat, Mr. Sia Kemping and Mr. Gan Thiam Po asked if we could expedite the flow of job support scheme payout to businesses. The disbursement of the JSS payouts is operationally more complex due to the need to check and validate information on workers, employers and payment mode. Hence, we had initially projected for the JSS payout to reach companies by the end of July. In the last few weeks, the agencies involved have redoubled efforts and are now targeting to bring forward the payment for GSS from end July to end May. Employers using bank crediting will get a payout about a week earlier. Enhancements to the wage credit scheme will be provided in the second half of this year. This way, we can spread out the, our support for enterprises in a more sustained way. These measures in the package also come on top of the existing support scheme for firms. For example, there will be a wage credit scheme payout of more than $600 million to firms next month, based on the parameters announced in Budget 2018. We should also look at the measures in the stabilization and support package in totality. We are providing a property tax rebate to qualifying commercial properties, for which property owners will receive their revised tax bills in April, and refunds of any excess property tax paid by the end of May. We are also providing rental waivers for government commercial tenants, the majority of which will apply to March and April renters. For the corporate income tax rebate, companies will receive their revised tax bills by the end of March. This will provide not just financial relief, but also help with enterprises' short-term short -term cash flow needs. Many, including Mr. Arasu Duraisamy, Ms. Denise Poa, Dr. Teo Ho Pin, Mr. Chong Ki Hyong, and Mr. Alex Yam, have asked if we can do more for businesses and for a longer period of time. We hope that will not be necessary. But if it does, for example, if the outbreak becomes a worldwide pandemic and the global economic impact is deeper and longer, we have the fiscal resources to do so and the will to act. We have the fiscal resources to do so and the will to act. But for now, let's go forth and make the fullest use of the support available out there before we review what more needs to be done. As I said, this is a fluid and fast-moving situation. There are many stories of businesses and workers who are not just making full use of the government support, but taking a step further to help each other and share the burden during this time of fear and uncertainty. Landlords, including Capital Land and Fraser's Property, have promised to pass on property tax rebates to affected tenants. The taxi and hire, private hire car companies have taken steps in partnership with NTUC, the National Taxi Association, Private Hire Car Vehicles Association and the government to care for their drivers in their hour of need even as they face challenges themselves. So I thank Mr. Ang Hin Ki for playing a key role in facilitating this. Many businesses have also responded to the challenge with resilience and foresight, taking the opportunity to accelerate innovation and invest for the future. This is exemplified by Park Royal at Kitchener Road. I visited Park Royal this Tuesday. I was impressed by the measures they are taking during the downtime to renovate the hotel, redesign processes, retrain their workers and redesign jobs. They are able to do this because even before the COVID-19 outbreak, they have been making plans to transform their operations to cope with manpower constraints. Now they are accelerating the transformation efforts, fully utilizing the support that we are extending to them. Our labour movement has also been hard at work to help workers cope and emerge stronger from this difficult period. I thank Secretary General Ng Chi Meng, Mr Heng Chi Hao and Dr Ko Po Kun for NTUC's strong leadership and partnership in this period and all his NTUC colleagues who are here in this house. Now this is a time for all of us to do our part. As Mr Vikram Nair put it, the entire population needs to come together to weather the storm. 
People from all walks of life have come together to help others at a time when it's tempting to just look out for oneself. Some are pooling their money. Young leaders from six business families in the Singapore Business Federation's Young Business Leaders Network have set up a $5 million fund called the Helping Our Promising Enterprises, or SBFYBLN Hope Fund, to provide financing help for local enterprises hit by COVID-19. In another example, the Maturity Trust, a charity, is raising $500,000 under the Singapore Strong Fund to fund ground-up projects to help the community stay strong amid the COVID-19 outbreak. Many are also pooling their time. Mr. Dallin Lim started the initiative, Ops Hands On, to provide free masks and hand sanitizers to seniors and vulnerable citizens vulnerable residents in neighbourhoods across Singapore in collaboration with local residents' committee and community clubs. Even our children are doing their part. Students and staff from Wellington Primary School and several other schools made personalised cards to show support and appreciation for our frontline health workers. Several members of this house have shared heartwarming stories of how the community has banded together to cheer on our frontline workers as they combat the COVID-19 outbreak. Mr. Alex Yam talked about how volunteers in UT baked cookies for our frontline heroes. Ms. Ting Pei Ling talked about Singaporeans who wrote messages and prepared gifts to express their support and cheer them on. Our frontline health workers deserve our fullest support and encouragement. Indeed, our frontline workers, especially healthcare workers in the restructured hospitals, have shown outstanding courage and dedication. They are out there making daily sacrifices to fight this war against the unknown. As Mr. Xia Kenpeng put it, they act not because they have no fear, but in spite of it. Senior staff manager Ziada Zainuddin has, has worked more than 12 hours a day at Singapore General Hospital's isolation ward. Despite missing her birthday celebration with her family, she did not let COVID-19 stop her from doing her job. Dr. Melissa Tians responded to NCID's call for volunteers at its 24-hour screening centre, even though it meant sleeping in a different room from her husband and foregoing time with their two children. Dr. Margaret Soon, the Director of Nursing at NCID and a veteran of SARS, cancelled the family trip to work at the front line. But her family understood and supported her, including her daughter, whom she was pregnant with during SARS 17 years ago. The selflessness and commitment of our healthcare workers have shone through as they bravely care for those affected and tirelessly work to contain the spread of the virus. They are an inspiration to all of us, and the spirit of excellence has been recognized around the world. While we cannot thank them enough, we can show our appreciation and support in a tangible way. The government will award public officers on the front line who are directly battling with the COVID-19 disease up to one additional month of special bonus. This will include many healthcare officers in MOH and the restructured hospitals and some officers in other front lines agencies who have been directly involved. Other public officers who have contributed significantly will be recognised in appropriate ways. We'll also make a one-off COVID-19 grant to the public health preparedness clinics to support them in their active role caring for patients with respiratory symptoms. This gesture, plus the many words of encouragement and acts of consideration and kindness, is our way to express to you, we salute you. We will win this war over the virus by fighting as one united people. Our citizens and institutions all play a part. Enterprises and senior management standing with unions and our workers, landlords supporting tenants, neighbours looking out for one another, political leaders working hand-in-hand -hand with public service and the people 
to do everything that will help see this problem through, they will help us see this problem through together. Singapore has been able to respond strongly and effectively to COVID-19 because there is strong trust between the people and the government and the sense that we are all in this together. The government can make decisions quickly and carry them out effectively because Singaporeans have confidence that those responsible know what they are doing, care about their health and safety, and share their worries and concerns. We do not hide bad news. We do not flinch from doing the right thing. We will go the extra mile to help every one of us come through this together. That is why people comply with stringent quarantine orders. People accept reassurances about masks. People feel safe and carry on with their lives. The fundamental basis for this is trust and solidarity between the government and the people. The political leadership will do our part to show solidarity with fellow Singaporeans. All political office holders will take a one month cut in their salary. All members of parliament will also take a one month cut in their allowance. The President has informed me that she will join in to take a similar one-month pay cut. Some senior public officers will take a half-month, senior public service officers will take a half-month pay cut. In the weeks and months to come, we will need to draw deeply on Singapore's reserves of resilience, trust and solidarity. This unity of purpose across our whole society is what will see us through these challenging times. And if we conduct ourselves well in this crisis, we will replenish those reserves and strengthen our resilience and unity for another generation. As engineer Dr. Li Bihua said yesterday in Singapore, you will never walk alone. Budget 2020 provides critical support to Singaporeans and businesses in this hour of need. We are able to do so because we have managed our finances prudently and planned ahead to make sure that we always have enough to meet our people's needs. COVID-19 will not be the last challenge that we will face. When this passes, we will continue to face the longer term structural challenges of an aging population, technological disruption, social inequality and climate change. We will continue to face sudden and unexpected situations, be it new virus outbreaks, threats to our security or financial crisis. A responsible government must ensure that the nation has the resources to meet these challenges and unexpected events, so that present and future generations of Singaporeans have the wherewithal to survive and thrive. As Mr. Sito Yipin put it so well, we must always be ready we must always provide for our future. Two years ago, I announced that we would need to raise the GST sometime from 2021 to 25. Various parties have questioned this plan. Some have called for the GST rate increase to be delayed or dropped completely after I announced that it would not take effect in 2021 and that we have prepared a $6 billion assurance package. In place of the GST rate increases, some have suggested alternatives, including raising income and wealth taxes as well as spending our reserves and more of its investment returns. Which path we choose and how we decide to share the burden of providing public services and building our collective future will define us. Will Singaporeans stand together to share the responsibility of providing for our collective future? Or will we pass the cost to our children and grandchildren? In many societies, such tensions have divided communities and created fault lines between millennials and baby boomers. So it is critical that we make a collective and informed decision to share the efforts and costs fairly, with citizens appreciating the reasons and values behind this decision. 
Many have been advocating that I give out more sweets, more M&M, &M -M, more and more. Be a generous Chai Sun Ye or God of Fortune. It would be easier if I could deliver every budget with just more good news, more spending on everything, more subsidies, more universal handouts, and keep quiet about how we will pay for all of this. But this would be irresponsible. It has never been the Singapore way, and I hope it will never be, because Singaporeans deserve better. So I'll spend some time explaining the rationale and the hard choices and trade-offs that we have to make. I hope that you will understand and appreciate the care and concerns behind the careful planning. If we did not care as much for our collective future, we would not have thought so long and hard and expended so much political capital. Let me speak on two sets of issues in turn. First, I will explain why raising GST remains the responsible way for all of us to meet our society's future needs. Second, I will explain why we should continue to steward our reserves well to safeguard the interests of future generations of Singaporeans. First, let me reiterate why we need to raise taxes. Nobody's like taxes, not even ministers for finance. As a government, our approach is to tax lightly so that people can keep most of what they earn and so that they can decide how best to spend it for themselves, for their families, or to donate it. But there are many critical national needs that are better met by government provision through taxes. This includes building up health care facilities and services and providing subsidies to ensure that our health care needs are well taken care of. This includes important priorities like mental health, which Ms. Antia Ong spoke about passionately and which will be discussed further during the COS. I agree with her that good mental health is a foundation for well-being and resilience. And we have already started including this as part of our work on human potential that have added to our national R&D budgets. This includes developing good and affordable preschool services and education to give all children, including our children with special needs, a good start in life and the best chance for success, regardless of background. This includes building up the SAF and home team to support our way of life in an era of emerging external digital and terrorist threats. These are all issues that many of us in this house care deeply about and made eloquent pitches for the government to spend more on. There must be a role for the government to redistribute resources in the right way so that everyone shares in the fruits of progress. One way to do this is through schemes that enhance the capability, oh, sorry, our way to do this through schemes, is through schemes that enhance the capability of our people through investments in education, health care, and the provision of housing, as well as schemes to mitigate inequality like workfare and civil support. Mr. Singh asked earlier whether I, I could provide more details about our expenditure. In fact, I noticed that several MPs have gone through my budget annexes and looked at how much spending has increased for various ministries. So let me just take this occasion to cover one important area. An important area because the big shift in public expenditure in the next decade will be in health care spending. It will grow significantly as our population ages and as technology, medical technology improves. Now let me show you a chart that shows Singapore's and other countries' public health expenditure as a percentage of GDP against the share of the total population that is over 65 years old. So on the x-axis is a percentage of total population is more than 65 years old and on the vertical axis is a public health expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Now the triangle shows the year 2000 and the circle the year 2015. 
So in other words, a period of 15 years. When you look at the green line, South Korea, the purple line, USA, New Zealand, Germany, the blue line, and Japan, the yellow line, you can see how they have all gone up sharply as population ages and as technology improves. And as a percentage of GDP, the USA is at the highest at almost 14 percent, Germany at about 9 and Japan at also about 8 or 9. In Singapore, it, is about, it has also risen. Now, the dotted line represents the future, the projections by the OECD. The OECD have made similar projections for others. So we did a similar projection to look at what would Singapore's numbers be if we use the MOH's projection. And that is the bottom, the lower line, right, the lower dotted line. And then the upper dotted line is if we were to use the OECD's methodology, um, OECD's uh, the, uh, trends. So as the share of seniors increase, increases over time, public health expenditure has simply increased. And as I said, medical technologies will continue to improve. And this trend has been played out in Singapore and other, all the other countries shown in this chart. Over the past two decades, our healthcare expenditure has grown rapidly. In, 2000, in 2000, government spending on healthcare was about 0.7% of GDP. By 2015, it had tripled to about 2.1% of our GDP. This additional spending has gone towards significant improvements in healthcare accessibility and affordability. We have introduced new schemes such as MediShield Life and expanded CHAS to cover all Singaporeans for many chronic conditions. Since 2010, we have opened or expanded eight hospitals. We have built two new polyclinics and redeveloped three existing ones. Now, don't get me wrong. The spending is not just on the infrastructure. For every hospital that you build, the CAPEX that we put in, the operating expenditure, the OPEX, is even more. So it just tells you the trend that we are heading towards. And healthcare spending is not just about treating the sick. It is also about giving our seniors a better quality of life. The number of cataract operations per year on seniors increased from around 10,000 in 2000 to almost 30,000 last year. Such procedures were less common in the past because people did not live as long as they do today to need them. And because of advances in medical sciences, previously incurable diseases like cancer can be better managed and patients can continue to live for more years with good quality of life. The number of citizens aged 80 and above has almost doubled from 63,000 in 2009 to 112,000 in 2019 and will increase further. Going forward, healthcare spending will continue to grow significantly. So while it is a very good thing that our people are living longer, we must be prepared that we will have to spend more on healthcare. So we expect public health care spending to grow by uh, around 1% percentage point of GDP over the 15 years from 2015 to 2030. And this is in fact, as I mentioned to you earlier, less than the average increases projected in the OECD countries, partly because of our efforts to keep health care costs sustainable and because Singaporeans have increasingly adopted healthier lifestyles. But our health care spending may rise by more than this one percentage point if medical costs rise throughout the world and we do not bring problems like obesity and diabetes under control. As Mr. Lim Biao Chuan said, Singaporeans must understand that increased spending on health care must come from somewhere. Some have wondered if we can spend less or spend more efficiently. And indeed, it's not just about how much we spend, but how well we spend. Today, we achieve good outcomes at a lower cost than many other countries. In health, we have the long, highest life expectancy in the world, almost 85 years, but still spend less of our GDP compared to other countries, as you can see in this chart. 
our life expectancy compared against public health expenditure as a percentage of GDP of various countries. In fact, former World Bank President Jim Yong Kim said that it was stunning that Singapore had achieved its current outcomes despite relatively low spending. So I will thank you to our people and our healthcare workers for taking care of their own health and for doing such a good job. Similarly for education, our 15-year-olds do well in international indices of educational attainment like the PISA test, despite Singapore spending less than other countries. We are able to achieve this only because of a whole of society effort. On the government's part, we have carefully designed our education and healthcare systems to deliver good services in a cost-effective manner. We have dedicated and passionate educators who believe in developing every child to their fullest potential. We have committed healthcare professionals who believe in delivering the best care to all Singaporeans. There is strong support for Singaporean families from community groups and social, services, social service agencies. And Singaporeans themselves play an important role in taking responsibility for their own learning and health. And we are always looking for ways to improve outcomes in a cost-effective manner. Minister Lawrence Wong will elaborate on some of these efforts during MOS COS. But efficiency savings will never be enough to fully offset the growth in healthcare spending as the population ages and medical technology, medical sciences improve. Efficiency savings can only mitigate it. To believe otherwise is wishful thinking. Ms. Fumiha shared that some Singaporeans have questioned the need to raise revenues to meet the expenditures I mentioned, pointing at surpluses seen in this term of government. But our health care spending needs are not one-off needs. They are recurrent needs, meaning that these needs will be there year after year. In fact, growing year after year. So we need to fund them using recurrent revenues, not one-off surpluses seen in this term of government, which arose from unexpected rally in global financial markets and the unexpected buoyancy in the property market. We cannot hope to keep on being so pleasantly surprised. Things can very quickly swing in the opposite direction as we have seen from the COVID-19 outbreak. The outbreak reminds us why we need to plan ahead to raise revenues. We must ensure that we have enough resources to meet our people's needs, driven by structural factors. Otherwise, we will find ourselves short and have to raise taxes or cut spending in difficult times, precisely when businesses and people need a boost. Planning ahead entails being honest with ourselves and with citizens and having the discipline to raise revenues in a timely manner. Yet among those who agree in principle on the need to raise taxes, some have asked, why GST? As I've explained before, a broad-based tax like GST is an appropriate and responsible way to pay for major societal needs like health care spending. Such benefits spending benefits all Singaporeans and so it is fair for everyone to bear some part of the cost. This is about all of us taking shared responsibility to pay for our needs and our society's needs and sharing in the effort to provide for them. It is at the same time a Singapore style GST that comes with offsets to ensure that those with lower incomes pay much less than those who are well off. In fact, at the individual level, many Singaporeans are willing to chip in to meet these needs. In my conversation with my constituents, I've asked if they would be willing to contribute just 20 cents more out of $10 that they spend a day, if this will help to ensure that their health care needs and those of their parents were adequately taken care of. Many were willing to accept this small cost for the peace of mind. The compact does not change when we project it, at the national, into the, project it to the national level. The compact does not change when we project it to the national level. This is ultimately about us collectively chipping in 
to look after the health care needs of our families. Each generation must pay for its own spending. Ms. Fumiha and some others have asked if we should raise income and wealth taxes instead of GST. In fact, we have been doing so in recent years. In 2010, we made our property tax regime progressive by introducing higher tax rates on owner-occupied residential properties with higher annual values. We enhanced the progressivity of our property we enhanced the pro progressivity of our property tax system in 2013 with higher property tax value for homes and non-owner non occupied residential properties. In 2015, we raised the top marginal personal income tax rate from 20 to 22 percent. The following year, we introduced a cap on the personal income tax relief to make our regime more progressive. In 2018, we raised a buyer's stamp duty for residential properties in excess of $1 million in value. In all these times, when we are raising income and wealth taxes to support the country's growing expenditure, the GST rate remained at 7%. The last time we raised it was in 2007, more than 10 years ago. But we should bear in mind that there is a limit to raising income taxes. If we keep raising income taxes, you will eventually hurt middle-class Singaporeans who presently pay very light income taxes. You also risk losing our ability to attract talent and keep our own talents. As Ms. Ting Pei Ling said, talents begets talents. There is a virtuous cycle to this. It is important to have a critical mass of talent in Singapore to create jobs and economic vibrancy which will benefit Singaporeans. That said, as important as raising the GST is, it is only one way to meet our revenue needs. An increase of two percentage points in the GST rate will provide us with additional revenue of almost 0.7% of GDP per year. But the increase in annual government health care spending alone that I mentioned already exceeds the amount of additional revenue. So we will continue to adjust our income and wealth taxes to raise revenue in a progressive and fair manner. We should, we should also keep international tax developments in mind as we review these taxes. Both personal income tax as well as corporate income tax. As Mr. Cedric Fu and Mr. Henry Quack noted, there are ongoing international discussions to revise tax rules under the base erosion and profit shifting project. Hub economies with small markets like Singapore stand to lose corporate income tax revenue if new rules are adopted. This is because the new rules allocate taxes to where the customers are rather than where the underlying economic activity is conducted. Businesses are highly mobile in today's global economy. Companies, especially multinationals, have the flexibility to relocate their businesses out of Singapore to elsewhere. Singaporeans may lose their job. So Mr. Singh asked me earlier about the status of BEPS. Well, in fact, I'm glad that the Ministry of Finance officials have been very involved in these international discussions. Some of these discussions are confidential in nature. Some of it have been made public. But I assure Mr. Singh that you know, hub economies will have to bear some negative in this exercise for the reasons I mentioned, where you tax the activity. Is it where the consumers are or where the underlying economic activities are? That change in principle alone, you can work out what the effects will be for us as a hub economy. So we therefore need to strike a fine balance between our corporate income tax rate and economic competitiveness. Ultimately, how much we spend depends on how much we collectively have to pay in the form of taxes. This chart shows a standard GST or value-added tax rates that other jurisdictions adopted, uh, adopt compared with our future rate of 9%. Among the Nordics, for example, the value-added tax rates are as high as 25%. They also have top personal income tax rates as high as over 50%. They have accepted higher taxes as a price for their higher social spending. 
Even as we seek to keep the GST rates low, we have to make trade-offs as we increase our spending for our health care and other needs. After raising the GST to 9%, it will still be lower than the average rate in Asia and less than half of the average rate in OECD countries today. Many countries in the region and elsewhere have standard GST rates that exceed 9%. Even Saudi Arabia, a country with huge oil reserves, is carefully planning ahead and introduced a 5% value-added tax from 2018. Do we have oil? No. So let me address concerns raised about the impacts of the GST hikes on the lower income and the impacts on cost of living. In designing our fiscal system, we have always sought to achieve a fair and progressive balance, where the better off contribute more and the lower income receive more support. This overall philosophy is a key consideration in how we design the GST and how we will implement the GST hike. This is why I have announced an assurance package to cushion the increase for all Singaporeans when the revised GST rate kicks in, in by 2025. This provides a bigger and thicker cushion to the lower and middle income, including many seniors. This package effectively delays the impact of the GST increase for the majority of Singaporean households for at least five years. For lower income Singaporeans, the offset will be even higher, and hence, there is effectively no increase for them for 10 years. There have been questions over the logic of raising GST and providing a $6 billion assurance package for GST and whether we can just delay or not even increase GST rate at all. Now, delaying the GST increase is not the same as raising the GST and providing offsets. This is because of the design of our system and the resulting incidence of the GST burden. Today, we flow part of the GST revenue back in the form of a GST voucher that gives more to those who need it most, particularly the lower income and retiree households. This is a permanent part of our system and will be enhanced when the GST hike takes place. The GST voucher reduces the net GST borne by lower and middle income households. Net GST is the amount of GST borne by each household after accounting for the GST voucher they receive. With the GST voucher, the bottom 40% of resident households are estimated to account for less than 10% of the net GST borne by all households and individuals. On the other hand, a significant part of the net GST is borne by foreigners and higher income households. Mr. Liang Yinghua asked, what proportion of the GST is borne by this group? Foreigners residing in Singapore, tourists, and the top 20% of resident households are estimated to account for over 60% of the net GST borne by all households and individuals. This is after taking into account GST refunded under the Tourist Refund Scheme for goods bought here for consumption abroad. This is partly because foreigners do not benefit from the GST voucher and offsets, which are available only to Singaporean households. When we eventually increase the GST rates to 9%, foreigners pay the higher rates immediately. In contrast, Singaporeans receive offsets to cushion the impact through both the permanent GST voucher and the assurance package. And as I said, for, some, for households, it's equivalent to not having the GST increase for five years and for some even 10 years. So all in, the GST increase implemented together with the assurance package will achieve, achieve different objectives. Most importantly, we delay the impacts of the increase on most Singaporeans by five years or more, and even longer for the lower income. We can start collecting revenue from foreigners residing in Singapore and tourists, and our businesses make the changes to their IT system only once. The GST is one part of our fiscal system. When you look at the system of taxes and benefits as a whole, it is a progressive one. 
Those who are better off contribute more. The top 10% of taxpayers pay about 80% of personal income tax revenue. As shown in this chart, lower and middle income households receive proportionately more benefits than the taxes they pay, whereas higher income groups contribute a far higher share of taxes than the share of benefits they receive. So as you can see, the top 20% pay 55% of the taxes and receive 12% of the benefit. The bottom 20% pay 9% of the taxes and receive 28% of the benefits. So let me summarize what I've explained in three points. First, we care for fellow Singaporeans and want to support them, especially in health care. To fund this spending, we need to raise the GST. Second, we will take collective responsibility to look after one another. Raising the GST, a broad-based tax, to meet a broad-based need is a sustainable approach. Third, we ensure that we are fair when the GST is raised. Through the assurance package, we will effectively delay the increase for almost all Singaporeans by at least five years. And over and above the transitional support, the permanent GST voucher will further help the lower and middle income. Now let me address questions that have been raised over the use of our reserves and suggestions that it should be used to fund our needs instead of GST. The reserves are our nest egg, born of hard work and discipline. During the earlier years of economic catch-up, Singapore experienced fast growth and had a young working population. Our founding fathers made the decision to save the country's surpluses and invest it for the long term to build up Singapore's nest egg. They could have just spent it to gain immediate political advantage. But they were principled and had a long-term interest of our people and our nation at heart. In FY 2019, our net investment return contribution was $17 billion, or 3.3% of GDP, the largest single contributor to the budget. This is highly unusual and a very fortunate position. Most advanced countries, shown in the lower half of this chart, pay about 2% of their GDP in debt servicing of accumulated debts. They collect taxes to pay off the debts of previous generations. So you can, as you can see from that graph, the red line is the US and the green line on top is France and with UK, Germany and uh, in between at about 2%. Yeah. Yeah. France and Germany, sorry. France and Germany. Yeah. Now, in Singapore, as shown in the top half of the chart, it is the opposite. Our reserves generate substantial returns which help to keep our taxes low. In other words, in most advanced countries, citizens today pay for the spending of past generations. In Singapore, it is the reverse. Citizens today enjoy the benefits of the savings from the past, thanks to the foresight and policies of our founding generation of leaders and people. Now you can work out the sums simply. Today, NIRC at $17 billion is more than personal income tax at $12 billion, GST collections at $11 billion. If we did not have the NIRC, even doubling personal income tax or doubling the GST rate to 14% would still not be enough. Tell me, in which other country are citizens able to reap the benefits of past savings in this way? So let us never forget that what we have inherited is very unusual 
and very precious. Let us be responsible and steward this properly for our future generations. Mr. Leon Pereira asked if we can slow the rate of growth of our reserves and release more funds to invest in our people and companies. I'm sure he's aware that in 2008, we introduced the Net Investment Returns Framework and in 2015, we passed a constitutional amendment to add the MASIC in the framework. This has resulted in a significant increase in NIRC that has gone towards various spending, including investments in our capabilities to generate future growth. Put another way, today at $17 billion, the NIRC is able to cover almost the combined budgets of MOE and MTI. More importantly, our reserves gives us a confidence as a small country with no natural resources of any kind to deal with the ups and downs in the world. This is why we have a robust system of robust set of rules to safeguard and manage the use of reserves. The President plays a critical role in guarding against profligate spending and to ensure proper use of our past reserves to safeguard Singapore's interests when needed. During the global financial crisis more than a decade ago, with global financial markets in turmoil and governments around the world scrambling to protect bank deposits, then-President S.R. Nadan approved the provision of $150 billion from our past reserves to guarantee bank deposits in Singapore from October 2008 to December 2010. That calmed our depositors. I, you know, I was the managing director of MAS at that point. And I can tell you that our officers in MAS worked day and night to safeguard this, to safeguard the stability of the banking system, and totally conscious that we are calling, we are using our past reserves as a guarantee. But we are also confident that the guarantee will be put to good use because it is to stabilize the confidence of depositors. So throughout that period, we had a very difficult time, but towards the end of it, we did not have a single bank run, and $150 billion remained untouched. It went back to our past reserves. Singaporeans' money was safe. In 2009, then-President Nadan improved a draw of $4.9 billion from our past reserves to fund the resilience package to help us overcome the global financial crisis. A year later, after the economy rebounded sharply, the government decided to return the money used to our past reserves. It did not have, have to, but did so to maintain the discipline that has allowed this unusual move in the first place. This year, we have not had to tap on our past reserves. But it was the same spirit of prudence that allowed us to have enough surplus this term to provide the fiscal support for our economy and our people. But if the situation deteriorates significantly and calls for us to tap on past reserves, I will make a case to the President to seek her approval to do so. Now, we can all do the easy thing and avoid the pain for ourselves today. We can decide not to raise GST to pay for our own spending, but to tap on our reserves and its investment returns instead. But by doing so, we will soon deprive future generations of the benefits that we enjoy today. What would that then say about us? During a parliamentary hearing in 2001 on the bill to allow the government to use part of the returns of investments from our reserves, our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said, and I quote, What is the deepest obligation of any government? It is not to the present and certainly not the past, but to the future. Let me repeat that. What is the deepest obligation of any government? It is not to the present, and certainly not the past, but to the future. We have a duty not just to those who make their views known today, but also to the young and the future Singaporeans. They are not here today to represent their interests because they are not born yet. But, if, but we have a responsibility to them and to take decisions which are difficult for us but which will safeguard their interests. 
So let us continue to keep that discipline and keep faith and promise to future generations of Singaporeans by stewarding our reserves well in our time. Climate change is another area where we may not live to reap the benefits of our decisions, but our children will. In this budget, I have set aside a $5 billion for a coastal and flood protection fund. I could have chosen instead to spend it on more Hong Pao's or red packets to make myself more popular. But by making the commitment today, these resources will go towards palms, tidal gates and infrastructure that will keep our children and their children safe from rising sea level in decades to come. Climate change threatens our very existence as a small, low-lying island state. But, Singaporeans has always, but Singapore has always risen to the challenge in the face of adversity. We have never accepted our fate of our starting circumstances meekly. Instead, we adapt, innovate, mitigate and overcome. We turn constraints into opportunities and strengths. Dealing with our water and land constraints has made us leaders in water technology and urban planning. Our manpower constraints constantly push us to automate, digitalize and be more productive. Now, we have a plan to address our carbon and energy constraints. We are meeting the challenge head on with an ambitious plan to tackle climate change. We are not only securing our coast, but also transforming our sources of food and water and remaking our entire economy and city for a green and sustainable future. Several agencies are working in concert to execute this, coordinated by the National Climate Change Secretariat. This year, we will update our commitment to the Paris Agreement and submit our long-term low emissions development strategy to contribute efforts to mitigate climate change. MTI and MUWA will prepare our economy and society for the low carbon transition by working with various stakeholders and partners to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and seize opportunities in a circular economy. Just as it had done with water, Muir is embarking on ambitious plans to develop our own food production capabilities with its 30 by 30 targets. MOT is working on our vision to phase out internal combustion engine vehicles and have all vehicles run on cleaner energy by 2040. MND is making efforts to make our towns greener and more sustainable <coughs> and transform Singapore into a city in nature. These are ambitious plans and we are bringing our R&D investments in urban solutions and sustainability to bear to realise this vision. The respective ministers will speak more on these efforts and in fact the SMT will be speaking on this after this. I hope that their explanations will give Mr. Dennis Tan a fuller picture of all that we are doing to tackle this serious challenge. He and Mr. Yi Jia Singh, Mr. Ang Wei Neng and Mr. Morali Pillay gave their perspective on the adoption of electric vehicles. The government is playing our part. We already have the vehicle, vehicular emission scheme in this budget I announced the EV and I announced the EV adoption incentive. This will help to close the cost premiums between EVs and internal combustion engine vehicles. Over time, as technology improves, we expect the cost differential to close further. However, while we want to encourage drivers to re replace their internal combustion engine vehicles with EVs, we should bear in mind that the cleanest and most efficient mode of transport remains public transport. A car-like vision that Mr. Corbunan has articulated continues to be the main focus of our transport policy. And the Ministry of Transport will provide further comments later. This is a whole of society, multi-generational effort, and its success will depend on all Singaporeans taking action. I'm very happy that many young Singaporeans are passionate about this cause and want to be part of the solution. We are in for the long haul, and our journey to tackle climate change will span 50 even 100 years. It is, as one commentator pointed out, 
a big audacious goal. But if we do not have the courage and determination to tackle challenges that threaten our very existence, what is our ambition for? Such long-term investments, together with our reserves, represent our commitment to future generations of Singaporeans. If we take the long-term view and each generation plays its part, Singapore can face the future with confidence. It's confidence that we will always have the capacity to overcome every challenge, be it a virus outbreak, recession or rising sea levels. Confidence that we will be able to provide for our families and our community. And confidence that our children will have the best chance of a better life, come what may. I have not finished. <laughs> I told you I have two fouls. Now let me touch on how we will strengthen the social compact and continue to fulfil the promise of opportunities for all in changing times. Ms. Denise Pua, Associate Professor Walter Tessera and others spoke on the need to tackle inequality and preserve social mobility. Singapore was founded on a vision of a just and equal society, broad-based prosperity and equal opportunities for all, a society where every Singaporean, regardless of background and starting point, has a good chance to do better. Today, this remains this government's mission to enable all Singaporeans to enjoy the fruits of growth. Over the years, we have made good progress in fulfilling this goal, but we will confront complex new challenges ahead, including the pressures of technological and demographic change and the growing inequality of starting points as our society matures. Our, responses, our response to these challenges will define us. A growing number of societies have responded by turning inwards from the world, even as they grow more polarised and divided within. For Singapore to stay successful, we must have the courage to take a different path. We must continue to anticipate and respond to change, plan for the long term and find practical solutions to create better lives for Singaporeans. We must continue to stay open and connected to the world. A Singapore turned inwards cannot survive. We must continue to foster trust in society, a point which Professor Yako Ibrahim spoke yesterday. Above all, we must stay united as one people. Our unity is what makes Singapore's story exceptional. Mr Lim Swee Say in his trademark pithy way said we need globalization both a globally competitive economy and a locally cohesive society. Now this calls for us to do three things, to transform our economy to be globally competitive, to develop our people to seize these opportunities and to strengthen our social compact by ensuring that all benefit from the fruits of progress and no one is left behind. This will require us to put in place synergistic fiscal, monetary and structural policies with sensible and prudent fiscal policies that promote growth and social equity, appropriate monetary policy to promote macroeconomic stability, to maintain price stability and promote steady growth, and structural policies that expand the capacity of our firms and labour force for growth. Now let me touch on the actions that we are taking in our structural policies, starting with how we will transform our economy to keep it globally competitive. The global economy is undergoing tectonic shifts today and many countries face a new economic landscape. Singapore must move fast to secure growth and jobs in the next bound or face irrelevance. We have therefore embarked on an urgent journey to transform Singapore's economy. We started our work four years ago in 2016 when the Committee on the Future Economy was formed. First, we are moving quickly to secure our external economic space to create new opportunities and room for manoeuvre in an increasingly fragmented economic order. To write on Asia's growth, we are working to position Singapore as a global Asian node of technology, innovation and enterprise, 
as a trusted and valuable part of the network of global cities that are driving innovation and growth globally. We have enhanced our economic connectivity through our network of trade and agreements and avoidance of double taxation agreements. We have also created new linkages with other economies through digital agreements and new platforms and networks such as the Network Trade Platform and Global Innovation Alliance. And these moves diversify our markets and supply chains and have made us more resilient in times of rising protectionism. Second, we are increasing the capacity of our enterprises and industries to innovate, grow and transform. As Mr Ong Teng Koon pointed out, building up strong local capabilities and ecosystems for innovation is critical to our economic success and resilience. We, have therefore, we are therefore helping enterprises to deepen their capabilities at every stage of their growth. So I'm very happy to hear Mr Teo Selak sharing his personal entrepreneurship journey and by making use of the grant, but cautioning that not to overdo it or you would destroy the spirit of enterprise. Now, to strengthen our competitive advantages, we have expanded our R&D investments into new areas and technologies. Through these investments, we are harnessing the latest technologies to transform, transform our manufacturing and services sector and creating new growth clusters in areas such as urban solutions and sustainability, health and human potential, and agri-food tech. And we have brought industry and the research community together to experiment and collaborate with government in test bedding solutions in areas like urban mobility. Third, we are mobilizing and partnering our industries and enterprises to take ownership of their own economic transformation. We have brought industry stakeholders together via industry transformation maps across 23 sectors. But the success of each ITM comes down to the strength of leadership in our enterprises. Business leaders must have the mental agility and dynamism to experiment and resourcefulness to overcome constraints. That is why in this budget, we are supporting business leaders through the Enterprise Leadership for Transformation or ELT program. Our institutes of higher learning such as SMU have joined hands with Enterprise Singapore to support this effort. Enterprise Singapore will bring more partners on board the ELT program in the coming months. And at the industry level, partnership among businesses is key. So even as businesses compete with one another and seek to differentiate themselves, cooperation can help them do better, such as by forming alliances to capture opportunities overseas or collaborating to test bed sector-wide solutions. And this is exemplified by the Singapore Man Manufacturing Federation, which under Mr. Douglas Foo's leadership is making a concerted effort to transform the manufacturing sector. The Singapore Poultry Hub is another example. A joint venture between five poultry producers and processors, the Hub's Smart Factory will deploy emerging technologies to increase productivity by 26% and production capacity by 70%. By working together, these poultry producers were able to achieve the scale needed to transform a labour-intensive process. So though they remain competitors, they certainly didn't chicken out from working together. As Minister Josephine Teo reminded us, economic transformation is not painless. Businesses must be willing to bear the transitional pains to be creative and resourceful and to seize opportunities where others see challenges. Encouragingly, we are, beginning to see, we are starting to see the fruits of our moves to transform the economy. Productivity has grown in the last three years and our enterprises are entering new markets. We are seeing continued confidence and investment in Singapore despite economic headwinds. Investments commitment attracted by EDB in 2019 amounted to $15.2 billion in fixed asset investments and $9 billion in total business expenditure per year. This shows that we are taking steps in the right direction. Most importantly, our efforts are creating more and better jobs for all. Over the last 10 years, local employment has grown steadily, adding more than 41,000 jobs each year on average. Local unemployment has stayed low at about 3.2% of resident labour force in December 2019 on a seasonally adjusted basis. 
Above all, locals are benefiting from the jobs created. Earnings have increased. Since 2010, real incomes have risen by about 3% each year for the median full-time employed local worker. And more locals are employed in higher paying jobs. In 2010, 37% of full-time employed local workers earn a gross monthly income, excluding employers' CPF, of at least $4,000 in today's dollars, adjusting for inflation. In 2018, 51% of local workers earned at least $4,000. So, 51% in 2019 compared to 37% in 2010. At its heart, economic transformation involves the courage to brave transitional plans as we manage, as we change the way we do things. And if we can all move forward with this can-do spirit of initiative and partnership that we have shown in the past weeks, I'm confident that we will build strong firms that can grow and compete in the global arena and create good jobs for all Singaporeans. As our economy undergoes structural changes, our labour market is also facing profound structural changes. As our population ages, our resident workforce will shrink rapidly, tightening our labour market. People are living longer and expect to have longer, even multiple careers. And rapid advances in technology and business models will bring more frequent and disruptive changes to skills required at jobs. As Professor Lim San San and Mr. Christopher de Souza put it, change is the only constant, and we cannot run away from it. Our collective mentality towards upskilling must change, from nice to have to must do, a point that Mr. Teo Salak also mentioned earlier. Now, we are responding to these changes by taking a three-pronged, tripartite approach with the government, workers and enterprises working in close concert to deal with the structural changes in our labour market. The first prong is for government to invest in critical enablers of skills upgrading and in career support. We have shifted our approach to education to one that enables learning throughout lives. We are investing heavily in institutes of higher learning or IHLs to build a future-ready ecosystem. Together with other training providers or IHLs, our IHL offer a large suite of continuing education training or CET courses, many of which are industry relevant. And together with those provided by other training providers, our IHL CET courses provide a key pathway for individuals to gain skills and confidence to make career transitions and to realize their aspirations. The government subsidizes these courses heavily with subsidy rates as high as 90% of course fees. Beyond education, we are enhancing our support to help workers make the transition smoothly, and this is especially important for mid-career workers. Ms. Silver Lim spoke about their anxieties. We must turn these anxieties into actions that improve lives. Our Adapt and Growth initiative helps workers find opportunities to refresh their skills and transition to new roles faster. Professional conversion programs, or PCPs, help workers take on new job roles, and our career coaches give career guidance and help job seekers secure new jobs. When I visited Workforce Singapore Careers Connect last September, I met Mr. Lam Kong Chai, 58 years old. Mr. Lam has been hunting for job hunting for two years. With WSG's help, he was hired as finance director at Asia Europe Foundation. His hiring manager herself had previously received career advice from WSG and approached WSG to fill the role that Mr. Lam took on. And in turn, Mr. Lam worked with WSG to fill a vacancy in his team. So all three individuals ended up getting jobs. And the outcome of our Adapt and Growth initiative are encouraging. About nine in 10 of those who went through our PCPs remained in employment 24 months after placement. And about seven in 10 also earned higher wages after starting their new jobs. <coughs> Our coaches work with about 27,000 job seekers every year. In 2018, they managed to place about 7 in 10 job seekers into new jobs within six months. In this budget, we have built on these initiatives, paying special attention to the needs of mid-career workers in their 40s and 50s, 
by introducing the SkillsFuture Mid-Career Support Package. And we're increasing the capacity of our reskilling program by providing a hiring incentive to employers and providing a special SkillsFuture top-up of $500 to every Singaporean aged 40 to 60 in 2020. I'd like to thank Mr. Patrick Day, Mr. Melvin Yong and Mr. Liang Ying Hua for their suggestions on how we can help our mid-career workers and improve skills future, and this will be discussed further during the COS. The second prong of this approach is to enable our workers to take ownership of their own learning and growth through the skills future movement. Initiatives such as the skills future credit encourage each individual to take charge of the learning throughout life. Together with government subsidies for CET courses, our workers can access quality programs with low or zero out-of-pocket payment. Take, for example, a big data engineering for analytics course, which costs about $4,500 before government subsidies at a SkillsFuture Singapore appointed CET centre. A Singaporean worker aged 40 or older enjoys a 90% cost subsidy. The remaining $450 can be fully met from the worker's existing SkillsFuture credit or the top up that this worker will get in this budget. So the Skills Future Credit works in conjunction with the broader CET ecosystem of support that we have built up. So I hope this assures members like Mr. Arasu Dresami and Ms. Irene Kui, who raised concerns on the credit and concerns about whether it can really make a difference. And our labour movement is innovating and exercising collective leadership to strengthen individual workers' effort the job security that is initiated by SecGen in Chi Ming, as well as the Training Company Training Committee. Now, the third prong of our tripartite approach is to get our enterprises to step up their own enterprise transformation and intend them to redesign jobs and upgrade their workers. And with this synergy, we can achieve more. As Ms. Jessica Tan pointed out, leadership must come from employers. The next pound of skills future announced in this budget therefore mobilizes businesses to upskill their workers and redesign jobs through the skills future enterprise credit and the expansion of the productivity solutions grant for job redesign consultancy services. Enterprises will hire local workers aged 40 and above with no upper age limit through reskilling programs will also get hiring incentives. Ms. Ong Teng Kun was concerned that it would be hard for SMEs to take workers away from day to day business needs. In fact, there's no better time than now to do so. Many businesses are already using this downtime down to accelerate change. So this three-prong approach, building our tripartite framework, is our structural response to the structural changes in the labour market. We are able to do this because we have been investing significantly in our education upstream to build a strong foundation to enable our people's success. And investing upstream means supporting every child to reach their fullest potential. Today, over 90% of the total cost of educating our children from primary to pre-U level is subsidized by the government. In all, by the time a Singaporean child reaches 16, he or she would have received more than $180,000 in education subsidies, including preschool subsidies. And then when they go on to the, an institute of higher learning, which most students do, they get an additional 15,000 to 22,000 in subsidies per year. And students from lower and middle income households receive additional subs bursaries and subsidies on top of this, which are enhanced in this budget. We are now investing significantly more in affordable quality preschool education while giving low income families additional support for early childhood development through Kickstart. We are also equipping young Singaporeans with skills they need for the new economy, including the cross-cultural skills. And in this budget, I announced our, our 70 by 70 target, Asia Ready Exposure and Enhancements to the Global Ready Talent, Talent Program. Another key area where we invest upstream is housing, so that everyone has a home. We provide generous housing subsidies to keep HDB flats affordable. New HDB flats are sold at prices below their market rates. Over and above subsidies, we provide substantial housing grants depending on the income of the buyers. 
eligible first-time buyers who buy resale flats get grants of up to $160,000. Today, a resale flat can cost less than five times the annual salary of a median income household. This is much lower than international cities like Hong Kong, Sydney, London or New York. This chart compares the median house price as a ratio of the median household income in major cities before accounting for grants and the ratio will be lower with grants. You can see the numbers yourself. By intervening upstream in these areas, we provide a foundation of broad-based opportunities that enable everyone to earn their own success. As a result, Singaporeans have been able to enjoy the fruits of progress. Now I'll show you another chart that shows resident employed households have experienced sustained real income growth at the median, growing by 3.7% per year over the last decade. And you can see the numbers for yourself versus other developed economies. So while the data are not perfectly comparable internationally, the growth that we have experienced is higher than that of many advanced economies. In short, our approach in these changing times is to take structural measures to strengthen opportunity at every stage of life with all individuals, employers, unions doing their part. For this to succeed, the change must come from within. For all the programs that the government puts in place, each individual will have to take responsibility for their own growth and learning. If we, all, if we can all take on a mindset of growth and a spirit of resilience, we can be assured that we will emerge stronger and better to face the future ahead. Now, I've spoken on our first two strategies of transforming our economy and developing our people to enable opportunities for all. But for all our efforts to maximize opportunities for everyone, there will be some who will continue to face difficulties. So our third strategy is to strengthen our social compact by ensuring that all benefit from the fruits of progress. This budget provides further support for those who may face greater pressures. First, some face difficulties with employment and ensuring that growth in their income keeps pace with inflation, despite their best efforts. Associate Professor Walter Tessera, Mr. Zainal Sapari and Mr. Peng Ying Huat have spoken on the vulnerabilities of low-wage workers. The care and support package, which includes grocery vouchers to provide help with daily necessities, will help them and their families. It builds on our efforts in recent years to strengthen social support and safety nets for low-income workers and their families through enhancements to Workfair, the Progressive Wage Model and Comcare. The mayors and five CDCs have local assistance schemes to support the heartlands, as pointed out by Mayor Lo Yen Ling. And these local efforts, done in partnership with community partners, local merchants and many others, bring warmth and support from fellow Singaporeans and business owners who are also our neighbours. Second, there are retired seniors who had low incomes in their working years with little or no family support. We have announced substantial enhancements to silver support to benefit 100,000 more seniors and raise payouts by 20%. So these enhancements go beyond inflation growth to provide stronger support. Third, Mr. Melvin Yong and Mr. Saktiandi Supat spoke about the stresses faced by middle-class families that are sandwiched financially because they have to care for both their children and their elderly parents. Mr. Louis Ng, Ms. Yip Ping Siu, Mr. Desmond Chu and Mr. Daryl David also pointed out that they may face pressures in terms of time from balancing their caregiving responsibilities and work. Financially, we have given additional help for such families in this budget by providing those with young or school-going children with an extra $100 cash payout per parent, more GST voucher, use safe rebates for larger households, and passion card top-ups for their parents. Last year, we also announced measures to support parenthood and caregiving, including enhancements to preschool subsidies and a home caregiving grant under MOH's Caregiver Support Action Plan. Supporting and strengthening families will always be a priority for us. We will continue to look 
and how we can do so effectively. I thank members for their suggestions, and these issues will be discussed further at the COS. Now, these measures come on top of the extensive subsidies I mentioned earlier in education, healthcare, and public housing. This benefit all Singaporeans, including the middle class. Middle income households, those in the middle 20% by household income, benefit substantially from this system. In 2019, they received $2 in benefits for every $1 in tax paid. Overall measures that we have put in place over the past decade to provide good jobs for our people, develop them at all stages of life, and support the vulnerable have made a decisive impact in narrowing the income gap. The Gini coefficient after taxes and transfers fell to 0.398 last year, the lowest since 2001. This is encouraging, but our work is not done. We will always continue to look at practical, effective moves to tackle inequality and ensure that all Singaporeans progress together. Critically, Business and community have growing roles to play. The caring and cohesive society begins with everyday acts of kindness, of philanthropy and volunteerism. They, these are better antidotes to inequality than the politics of class warfare that we have seen around the world. The world. As Ms. Ching Liu put it, graciousness and kindness are indeed part of our Singapore spirit, and there's much we can do to build an inclusive society for all including those with special needs and persons with disabilities, Ms. Shara Chan, Dr. Intan Mokhtar and Ms. Rahayu Mazam reminded us. And this is why it has been my priority to support, enable and amplify the efforts of citizens and businesses to help those in need through Singapore together. These efforts are growing. In 2018, individuals collectively donated $2.1 billion through registered organizations, more than double the $960 million donated in 2008. Each donor gave an average of about $660, which is more than twice the amount in 2008. In addition, one in two businesses in Singapore gives back through philanthropy and voluntary. Our social service agencies have been doing good work for the community they too have been going through their own transformation journeys, building up technological capabilities to be more effective in helping those in need. For example, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Singapore has invested in the anti-gravity treadmill so that clients can practice moving and walking in a free-fall environment. And going forward, we'll partner the community to support more of such capability development efforts through the Community Capability Trust that I announced in this budget. Such investments and partnership with, will help social service agencies to overcome the manpower constraints that Ms. Joan Pereira spoke on. And this work is not just confined to organized sectors. Our democracy of this permits every level. Many MPs have shared stories embodying the spirit of Singapore together. Mr. Liang Yinghua and many others share about the spontaneous and thoughtful acts in many housing estates, such as fellow residents coming together to bottle hand sanitizers and placing them at least for residents to use. Ms. Rahayu Mazam shared about the passion among young people for a more inclusive, more compassionate society. They reminded us of the importance of engaging young people as we build this nation. I thank Mr. Pritam Singh for your support for the Singapore Together movement and your comment about MPs giving diverse views in this House. And I would say that we can go a step further you know, it, that a democracy of deeds means that we, each of us, taking action to realize the good. So I'm, it's very inspiring to hear how several members of this House are taking the lead to serve our community in their own diverse ways. And let me just highlight our, some of our NMPs. Associate Professor Walter Tessera, uh, an economist, have been doing a lot of work on the labor market. Mr. Douglas Fu leading the SMF effort, Mr. Terence Ho using the arts to enable and empower individuals from underprivileged backgrounds, Ms. Antia Wong Ong fighting to raise awareness of mental illness among us and to promote mental wellness, 
and Ms. Irene Kuei, who has served the public passionately in health care, in volunteering, volunteering in the hospice despite her many commitments, and Ms. Yip Ping Siu, who is an inspiring young athlete and showing Singaporeans and the world what it truly means, and Mr. Mohammad Ashad, who is fostering religious harmony and helping to build a more caring society, yeah. and uh, Professor uh, Insan San for your work on you know, this, uh, the need you know, to educate our young even better. Now this embodies the spirit of Singapore together, and as Ms. Denise Poir said, there are so many other areas that we can work together to build a better society, to take action to build a better society and improve lives. And she herself has taken so much action and devoted so much effort in uplifting people with special needs. So this is how we should rise to the challenge of inequality in this day and age. By coming together as one people to uplift the less privileged among us, with the states providing strong foundations of opportunity and support. I do apologize that this is longer than the, what everyone has been expecting. But there has been so many good stories, I thought it best telling. So thank you all for your patience in this Singapore Together effort. <laughs> you sit together to listen to my long speech. <clears throat> now, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me say a few words in Mandarin before I conclude in English. So, Rango 也不足以应付我们的开支需求可是如果我们动用储备金或过度依赖投资回报来应付经常性支出那就有如破坏损失砍伐这棵树我国的经常性支出在增长尤其是医疗支出我们需要不断的发展医疗保障 设施和提供医疗服务，确保年长国人得到充分充分照顾。政府的这些支出将让全体国人受益，所以让每个国人承担部分费用是公平的做法。我已经宣布，消费税在2021年将保持在百分之七。不过，政府还需要在2025年前或2025年或之前调高消费税。这不仅能让我们可以以可持续性的、有效的方式增加收入，也体现了我们发挥集体责任的价值观。在提高消费税的同时，我们会确保税收公平。永久性消费税补助券计划能减轻消费税对中低收入国人所造成的负担。此外，定型与援助配套可帮助大部分的新加坡家庭抵消相等于至少五年的额外消费税支出。对低收入国人来说，这个配套能为他们抵消十年的额
占了来自所有家庭和个人消费税净收的百分之六十以上。另外，政府也致力于确保我们的子孙后代继续享有可持续发展的生活环境，这是我们对国人的承诺。其中，气候变化所带来的威胁是我们必须面对的。作为一个岛国，新加坡很容易受到海平面上升和洪水的影响。除了应对气候变化所带来的影响，我们也必须继续打造一个宜居、温馨和富有活力的家园。二零二零年财政预算案是一个齐心共进的预算案，对抗二零一九冠状病毒，我们必须万众一心。我们特别感谢我们的前线工作人员。他们无私奉献，并以专业的精神坚守岗位。为表达我们的由衷敬意和感谢，分政府将给予照顾病患和面对较高风险的前线医疗医疗人员以及公共服务人员高达一个月的额外花红。此外，他们也将为公共卫生防范诊所提供一笔一次性的津贴。在这个艰难时期，我们珍珠领导人与国人同舟共济。今年担任政治职务者，将少取一个月的薪水，议员也将少取一个月的津贴。我国哈里马总统也表示支持，自愿减薪一个月。同样的，高级公务员也会少取半个月的薪金。在我们前进的道路上，我们会面对不少挑战，有的较长期，有的最为紧迫。国人担心二零一九年冠状病毒所带来的影响，我可以理解。但在面对眼前挑战的同时，我们也必须放眼未来。早报特约评论员严梦达把这个预算案，呃，贴切的比喻为三贴药方。分别是定心丸、润肺散和提神三味汤。定心与援助配套、经济呃稳定与资源配套、关怀与援助配套，以及转型与发呃发展策略，将多管齐下，确保新加坡在面对眼前挑战的同时，不失我们前行的大方向。这让国人。及企业在面对经济放缓同时，赔金蓄锐，为经济复苏做好准备。我们能做到这一点，是因为我们多年来谨慎理财、未雨绸缪，预留了足够的资金。与此同时，我们也也必也要负责，也要以负责任的态度善用我们的储备金。前人种树，后人乘凉，是我国长期规划财政的重要理念之一。我们要继续保护，并培育先辈们所栽种的树，信息后代，确保我们的子子孙孙有足够的资源，面对未来的挑战，把握机遇，创造更美好的新加坡。Mr. Speaker, I'll now conclude in English. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've spoken on the vision and mission of this, of the, this government on the shifts we need to make to thrive in the world ahead and how we need to work together to reach our goals. We began our journey as a nation with a mission, seeking the welfare and happiness of Singaporeans in a more just and equal society. Through rain or shine, we have never wavered from this mission. We live in a time of change and uncertainty today. But it is precisely in such time that our strength and resolve as a nation shines most brightly. Let us not be paralyzed and divided by anxiety and fear, but let us be energized and united by optimism and a common vision for tomorrow. Let us rise to the occasion and overcome the COVID-19 outbreak together, stepping up to take care of one another in these trying times. Let us share the efforts to build our future and nation together. Let us build a sustainable Singapore 
where we and our children can live our best lives in a safe, green and livable environment for all time and seasons to come. Let us grow as a city of possibilities, an open, globally connected city where each Singaporean can live to the fullest and bring our aspirations, hopes and potential to life. Let us continue to build a society of opportunity for all where we have the freedom to determine our own destiny based not on our starting points but through our own choices and efforts. And let us continue to foster a caring and cohesive community, living as equals, uplifting the most vulnerable among us and taking care of our fellow men and women. All of this is within our reach if we work as one Singapore. With collective action and leadership at all levels of society and with our diverse strength and passions combined, we can build a society that we can all be proud of. This is the spirit of Singapore together and it is alive today as shown by many Singaporeans including members of this house who are leading change in diverse ways. Above all, let us never stop thinking for tomorrow. In the long and never ending journey of nation building, each generation of Singaporeans are relay runners. May we always take good care of what we have inherited, run our best race and pass on a better future to those who come after us. This budget is about one step in this long race, bidding on the sweat and toil of generations who have run the race before us. It seeks to do right by Singaporeans, both present and future, through the financial plans and provisions that we make today. I thank all members of this House for your support for this budget. Let us unite and forge ahead as one Singapore to build a better Singapore for tomorrow. Singapore together, Majula forever. Thank you. Any clarifications? The question is that Parliament approves the financial policy of the Government for the financial year 1st April 2020 to 31st March 2021. As many as are of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.